Hi, and welcome to our session looking at virtual production. And I'm joined by uh, Brian. How are you, Brian? Very good, sir. And uh, now, whereabouts in the world are you at the moment? I'm in Los Angeles, California. And Mariana, where are you? And thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I am also in Los Angeles. We're very okay, close well, that's, to Brian and I. That makes it simple, right? <laughs> So um, I wanted to start our virtual production discussion. I've got so many interesting things I want to talk to you about. I mean, I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this, but I want to discuss at the outset, just um, not so much what a definition of virtual production is, but just address the fact that some people, I think, have focused on virtual production as just being LED volumes. And, and Brian, that isn't really doing it justice, is it? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, we generally tend to think that there are kind of multiple classifications of what can be considered virtual production. So it could be visualization, like all of your pre-visualization categories and visas of all sorts. Um, there is, you know, traditional VFX workflow and pipeline. Um, there is, you know, IC VFX, of course, and even certain forms of uh, you know, traditional linear animation creation could be considered virtual production. Um, it just depends on, you know, what your output, uh, your output source and where you're going uh, with it and what you're wanting to do with it uh, can determine any number of different virtual production scenarios. So and your budget but, and your budget and your budget. Yeah. But of course, you're at Epic Games, though. I think you notched up what 27 feature films that you were involved in in terms of uh, uh, using these sort of uh, amazing tools for pre visualization. Right. I mean, my whole past work history is, has been as a, a pre-visualization supervisor. And, you know, 15 years ago, we were riding the crest of the technology wave when it came to doing previs, And we had to convince a lot of people at that time that previs was an effective tool uh, and resource for filmmakers. In the very beginning, we got a lot of resistance um, because it was uh, something new. We were seen as taking people's jobs. It was a very unusual um, uh, and and it wasn't really embraced right away. But I feel that previs has become kind of a household term nowadays, especially amongst people in the industry. Everybody expects to do previs now. And I foresee a lot of uh, virtual production and in-camera visual effects going the same direction. You know, soon it'll be part of the larger vocabulary of filmmaking and it'll just be considered normal. I think also that that adoption of previs, which then became post vis, which became you know stunt vis, but that whole idea just uh, built on the idea that we were going to try and be more iterative in our filmmaking, and so it was a little less uh, that if somebody went back and did a reshoot, this was something that would be in the trade press as a horror gasp that they were doing reshoots, and nowadays that idea that we're going to look at things and iterate on them is just so inherently in the process that as you say we accept it, which of course feeds into also why we want to do virtual production and bring many of those things that were in post into an earlier stage. Definitely. I mean, the mantra of years past was fix it in post. And the mantra that we want to portray now is fix it in pre. You know, fix it in pre-visualization and pre-production. That's the place that you can make effective change that can carry into production and then not task and over uh, um, resource your post-production process to the point where it breaks. Uh, post-production should be for sweetening the final product, not actually constructing your film. In. And Mariana, you're the senior VP of global virtual production, which uh, is the most desirable job in the world, I think. But, um, but apart from that, what was your background that got you to where you are now? My background as a visual effects artist and visual effects supervisor, so being on set, you know, and as Brian was saying, I was working on set as a VFX supervisor. I started as an assistant VFX supervisor when the crew did not like you there at all. And if you have time to set up a green screen, you know, the the grips, the gaffers, they wouldn't help you. And the AV was like, you have two minutes or, you know, we're done. So um, I started. I remember uh, those days when they used to turn and look for the supervisor near the craft services table and they would just go, is that going to work? And you'd be like, yes. And they go, great, perfect. moving on. Yeah, and you get all the, you know, the evil eyes and all of that. Um, and then I worked my way up um, also doing the, you know, the visual effects on the computer. But then I moved into software development and then I moved into real time things to VR and game engines and then virtual production. 
I think the thing that you've experienced that's so acute is that we've moved back to the visual effects being part of a collaborative process with all of those other departments, because that's what virtual production is giving us, isn't it? It's like getting the conversation. The real-time tools allow us to have that conversation, otherwise it would you know, come back tomorrow kind of thing. But with that real-time tools, we now can be collaborators. And quite frankly, you must see this, right? Like we're collaborating in every single sort of part of the filmmaking process. Yeah, every single part of it. And I think part of what makes it so interesting as well now is just bringing the creatives back because, you know, another thing is like they believe like this technology is kind of pushing away creatives and on the contrary is giving them the power back as opposed to, you know, and including the talent as well, because now they have something to, for example, in a volume, their eyesight, they have something to react to as opposed to just, you know, a green screen or a tennis ball or whatnot. So it's just bringing that power back to the creatives and just helping them choose the right tool for the job and just having this agile process of, you know, being all involved in every part of the process as opposed to being siloed and, you know, just waiting from A to then go to B to then go to C. But I want to ask you about that because that's obviously the thing that we embrace, right? That creative collaboration and bringing stuff forward. But it's also pretty much the case that we had a generation of creatives that we might have taught bad habits to, in particular the idea of, well, I can just defer to making a decision until I see it later. And we kind of need people to be much more willing to commit if we're going to do virtual production, don't we? Don't we want to have a bit more of that decision making moved up front in the process? Definitely. Um, I mean, if you really look at the history of visual effects and uh, you know, like the introduction of Jurassic Park, where we started having, you know, CG dinosaurs and everything else a, a part of the mix. These processes took time. And the whole aspect of creating computer uh, graphics and computer generated characters and imagery um, effectively put that creative process into a black box. And that black box could be anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of months to see a result come out of. And a poor director trying to you know, put together a film with this kind of technology and this type of process, his whole creative process was kind of bifurcated into two paths, the traditional production path, and then this new CG path that had all these new terms and all these new technologies. And it left the director a little bit confused. Um, and, you know, cinematographers were hopefully the people that could help marry that back together but they were very very busy in their own rights you know helping to make sure principal photography went well so a lot of the whole um uh aspect of the cg element was brought into mainstream with previs you know, previs was there to kind of let the director visualize what was happening um in the world of cg and that worked very well, but it was still not in real time. And now when we start having computer graphics systems and we have you know, game engines and we have you know, super high end quadro cards that can render all of this stuff in real time, now all of a sudden it becomes an iterative process. It can be something that can be modified and adjusted on the day at the very moment. And creative decisions can be you know, completely altered and changed in an instant rather than having to wait potentially days or weeks to see a result. Mariana, one of the other things that we don't talk about enough, I don't think, is just the actors uh, in response to virtual production. And I think that like we can be a little harsh on actors sometimes saying, well, surely they can just pretend like that thing is there on the green screen. But obviously many films are shot out of sequence. So it's not as even if they're like working their way from the script from the front to the back. So they're trying to place themselves where their character is. And and react to stuff that isn't there. Now, once we've introduced virtual production, they can be more on the same page, which I guess you must see helps them, I guess, with their acting choices. Yeah, absolutely. Helping with their acting choices, be, you know, again, more creative. And most importantly, we talk a lot about uh, saving costs with virtual production. And I think in this case, for instead of having the actor do several takes of the same scene, or maybe then having to fix it in post again, because they're looking at something that's completely wrong. I mean, something super simple that is reducing that is just being able to actually react with whether your eyesight is that. Yeah, yeah, that, that whole problem of like sticking a tennis ball up and saying, you know, act to a tennis ball. It's all very well to 
to yeah. sort of say that. But yeah, it's my interpretation of what's going to replace that tennis ball may be very different to the directors, may be different to the actors. And so everybody needs to be working out of the same playbook. Um, I think that I think that that's terrific. So let's let's see if we can jump into the specifics of um, doing uh, volumes, and and that's been obviously a hot topic. Uh, the idea of being able to produce in real time, not just a virtual set, but a virtual set that's reacting dynamically to the camera. And Brian, I, I wonder, in, in your experience, how much is that reacting and dynamically updating the wall? change the experience over just sticking up something on the wall, which let's face it, we've been doing in TV production for, for years. Sure. I mean, again, going back to the early days of Previs, when we would render out sequences in Previs, we actually saw a greater actor response to when we would take that Previs and put it on large screen TVs and allowed them to watch it off on the side while they were doing their acting. It gave them a point of reference and it was very helpful for them. Now, all of a sudden, they can go into an actual volume. And with a game engine, you have something that can be uh, reacted to and, and adjusted in real time. It gives the actor a complete sense of, I think, a complete sense of freedom to, uh, especially if something is, uh, there might be some intelligence to, uh, driving some of the action that's happening on the wall, thanks to a game engine. So these, uh, the potential for, some effects or potentially background characters or any number of things could actually be uh, could have a certain level of intelligence too, reacting to um, what's happening on the stage, position of the camera um, or any other types of uh, technologies that might indicate the position of 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 actors on the stage. There's all kinds of really cool things that could happen. Yeah, there's kind of two levels to it, isn't it? And uh, Mariana, you must find this like there's this technical level, like I want to be able to pull off the right colors, the right uh, camera movements, low latency. And then there's sort of a, um, you know, that's at one level. And then there's another level of like, well, how am I going to uh, have this as a creative tool that can be flexible enough that the DP and all those other departments can interact with it and that the creatives feel like they've got something that is a tool, not like a, I guess, a, a requirement laid upon them. Yeah, exactly. And just briefly to add to what Brian's saying, also like a greater sense of immersion as well. Um, and to your point, Mike, I think that one role, which may or may not be, you know, virtual production supervisor or may or may not be a new type, like a virtual cinematographer, may completely be an, a new role, but I feel that it's needed this the creative and technology connection precisely what, what I've seen on set happen sometimes is like because there's like latency issues or there's some issue with the servers or with the LED panels or something then the conversation turns very technical very quickly right and you're talking about things that the creatives coming especially from like a very traditional filmmaking background or they're just used to you know changing the lights on set they're just used to the on set physical you know production world they're very put off by the, you know, very technical geeky talk, if you will. So you have to have, you know, there's this very important role, I feel, where it's like the connectivity between understanding what the technical people are going through, but then so you can explain it to in terms that the creatives can understand and feel, you know, welcome and feel like they want to continue to adopt this and not just be like cinematographer wants to change the lights like, oh, well, it's not going to work in the volume and, you know, period. Some of that, though, has to be um, part of the responsibility of the CG artists to make the migration to understanding cinematography, to understand all the various roles on the stage so that they're knowledgeable uh, and being able to translate what they're doing in CG onto an actual practical stage. And you know, if we can get that dialogue back and forth so that people who work on a practical stage understand better more of the computer graphic aspects of things, then you know we're getting somewhere um but yeah because i was going to ask you that i was going to actually ask you whether it's like the creative heads of department on set need to learn more about virtual production or the virtual production cg team have to learn more about on set i think both i think it's yeah. ab absolutely both because i see a little bit happening what was happening before with visual effects or what brian was saying with previous where there's like pushback because they, they get very put off by all these technical terms and they feel, again, it's going to take jobs that your skills are not going to be able to be put 
you know, to 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 work when you already know on how you work. So I feel it's a matter of both, you know, like CG artists also would benefit from knowing how real world cameras, lenses work, as well as, you know, what DPs have to do for lighting on set, et cetera, and then vice versa, you know, cinematographers, DPs, production designers need to be more aware of what virtual production entails, you know, so that you also, it's gonna benefit the way that your story is told ultimately. So Brian, let's talk about the technical for a, for a little bit. So there's kind of, I guess, what I think of as two kind of levels to this. There's the level where I've got LED uh, screens up and I'm producing stuff, you know, using maybe Unreal Engine feeding through like a really sensible setup. But quite frankly, I'm mainly concerned that it looks good through the lens. Maybe it's a car shot and I've got reflections. And if it helped for me to put trees in the ceiling, um, I'm just going to do it because it makes the reflections look cool and that's all I care about. And kind of think there's nothing wrong with that. And then there's another level where you say, I want to have accurate lighting and very precise lighting um, and that it's reflecting almost in a volumetric sense what's going on with the light fields and the way that the environment would be lighting the set. And I guess neither of those is wrong, but there's quite a big technical difference between the two. Yeah, there's huge differences between the two. That's why you'll find on a lot of professional stages that you'll have a virtual production colorist on staff or a color scientist on staff who understands all the intricacies of the necessary color science to match what is being projected and displayed on the wall. Uh, you know, the, the various um, uh, lookup tables and LUTs that you're going to need to translate that uh, visual image over to your final image so that they're all aligned and everything looks clean and efficient and uh, continuous. Whereas, you know, the more you know, shoot from the hip type of solution can be fine, um, you know, if it's not something that requires such color sensitivity and such accuracy, you're right, throwing up, you know, perhaps uh, some some panels or even TV screens and windows to act as uh, potential reflection sources for things. Do you need to have 100% color accuracy for something like that? Maybe not, but uh, it all depends on what your final product is and and how you're shooting it. So I guess the the expertise at Technicolor and for the group generally is knowing when to steer the client for needing that extra stuff and when they. And probably okay without having to do that because I can't imagine all the producers are that up to speed with the intricacies of what they actually even need. No. Um, again, uh, at Epic, we have uh, a color scientist who's on board. His name is Rod Bogart. He's amazing. Um, and he's uh, you know able to speak in terms of color science to a you know a level of you know doctorate level PhD. Um, and, you know, that's not somebody that you're going to normally have on set if you're an average run of the mill indie or even middle range uh, uh, filmmaker. But if you are a large studio and this is a very VFX heavy driven um, you know, production, you're going to need to have that type of person on staff. And if you don't, um, it can cost you. It can cost you in your final product and, and the colors being off or wrong and a lot of correction that would have to be made otherwise. So, you know. Mariana, do you, Mariana, do you find that the, your clients are already very technically literate in this space, or do you find that that's one of the services that they look for you to advise on? Oh, that's one of the services that they're looking for us to advise on. And for example, we have Matt Jacobs and Adam Valdez who are amazing and really under, you know, explaining color science and the lots and how they change with the LED panels and how they come in batches. and. You know, they're very good at explaining this, but I, I, I feel um, that this is an area that, by the way, wing wing to both of you, but classes on that because it's it's it also, you know, for example, if you bring up an ACES workflow pipeline in virtual production, there are very, very few people that know exactly what they're talking about. Um, so that's one. And two, what we also do a lot of at technical is just do a lot of LED pre-lighting and then just treat it kind of like a continuum where you just iterate and iterate and continue until you get to the final lighting stages. So I think that's also something, you know, that you could look at for, to Brian's point to benefit you and not so that it doesn't cost you at the end. But yeah, color science is a thing, LED pre-lighting. Obviously there are cost savings and there's this sort of, you know, 
uh, this often cited example that you can shoot for 12 hours of magic hour because you know the lighting is perfect and it's great and and we're seeing that used and no doubt even just uh, saving on fuel, petrol, travel time for being able to not have to go to remote locations. These are all savings. But at the other end of the spectrum, I was wondering, Brian, if we could dig in on why high end, the, the sort of the what I call the Cadillac suites, why they are expensive. Um, not because that somebody's jacking the price up, but actually it is a very hard problem to solve at the, at the high end. So clearly, um, you know, a range can be deployed. But if I just got to focus on the high end for a second, let's start discussing some of the reasons why those stages are so precise and uh, and obviously um, involve a lot of technology. So you mentioned the color science already. That's that's something that happens at like multiple points in that in that pipeline, doesn't it? Because I mean, the screens, the the uh, CMOS chips, like everything has to be a holistically solved problem. Correct. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you want to talk dollar figures, we can, but when it comes to the price of why these Mandalorian style stages are so expensive or these tier one stages are so expensive is you, know, you have a lot of components that have to be taken into effect. You have obviously a lot of video engineering equipment that um, is associated with such a facility. You know, you're going to have to make sure that everything it, you have a you know, house time code, house gen lock. Um, that you're using, um, you know, a, a fairly decent high-end camera, um, full a full-frame sensor with either a fast-rolling shutter or a global shutter. You're going to need to have, you know, obviously all of your control machines and your render machines that are, you know, rendering out content. So you're going to need to have high-end graphics cards, and all of these graphics cards have to be synchronized with Genlock. So that adds on to the price. And then, of course, you have to have all the LED processors and, you know, to scale all that information up onto the wall. So you've got, you know, either Megapixel or Novastar or Brompton processors that you have to buy and distribution units that route all of that to all of the individual panels. Um, all of this adds up. And then you have all of the video engineering associated with it when it comes to routing the HDMI and SDI signals, um, you know, multiplexing and combining all of these so that you can out on the stage, see combined images so that you can have something to look at as a reference. All of this adds up and, and adds to the price tag. Do you need absolutely every piece of these equipments to do virtual production? No, but if you're going to be doing something on the scale of Mandalorian, yes. And also, let's discuss the actual screens themselves. So in the early days, these screens were pretty much coming from areas that obviously weren't virtual production because it didn't kind of exist in this LED volume sense. Um, and we quickly saw that like off angle uh, colorimetry was a big factor and pitch is a factor. And so now we're seeing those pictures uh, get finer and the screens higher resolution and the LEDs designed to be uh, done at different angles. But like that puts more, it's not just the cost of the, of the screen, is it? It's the cost that that then reflects back into our whole pipeline of being able to support that. Sure. I mean, there's advancements that have been made in, in the specific um, LED panels that continue to improve. I mean, uh, earlier panels may not have been considered camera safe, meaning they weren't operating at a refresh rate that was a, you know, divisible factor of, of, of 60, you know, by the AC power that we use. And so um, if you wind up with slower refresh rates on some of these panels, you could wind up getting banding or you could get color blotchiness or you could get uh, any number of different artifacts that would, you know, potentially ruin your shot. So, yes, we're seeing a, a, a decrease uh, in the amount of, or shall we say, the the pixel density is getting better. The distance between the individual pixel pitch is getting smaller and more refined. The average uh, black pearl panels that we have uh, at the stages we have at Epic are 2.8 millimeters, which is a good, you know, decent size. Um, and the refresh rates on those panels are. Uh, 1920 hertz um, so they are camera safe so you can pretty much uh, you know point a camera at these uh, and um, um, use a select any pretty much any shutter angle or shutter speed at 60 hertz you're going to be fine and but we're also seeing 2.1s and 1.9s now aren't we yep um, there are I've seen 2.1s and I've seen 1.8s and uh, you know, of course, the, the more dense and uh, 
the, the tighter these are, they're probably also going to have faster refresh rates and it's going to cause the price of those panels to go up. They're going to be more expensive. So a lot depends even on the Mandalorian style stages, how much money you want to spend on these panels. You know, what pixel pitch you're going to have. Do you plan to have the camera closer to the wall? If so, you're going to need to have a tighter pixel pitch. If you're going to be OK with the camera being back further, you can have a little more leeway there to have you know higher pixel density. Um, um, or shall I say lower? <laughs> and Mariana, the other thing is not just that I've got all that tech there, but I want to not turn up and be having most of our team sitting around for half a day because things aren't quite working right. So the other thing that you guys are bringing to it is not just that I know what tech to have, but I have all that supporting structure in terms of the people so that the filmmakers can film. Oh, absolutely. And I think something really important to Brian's point is testing, because I feel like the, with because of the Mandalorian and of course before like the Lion King and Jungle Book and whatnot, a lot of, you know, creatives started to just decide that, oh, let's just go shoot in a volume because now, you know, we don't have to travel and we don't need green screens and all of our problems will be solved only to get on set and realize that things aren't working. You have all these people, you know, because it's not only how expensive all the hardware is and the software, et cetera, but it's also the crew. You can't just have a crew sitting there, right? Just like you wouldn't do that in, in an actual production. So actually coming to the volume prior to start your shoot and making sure that it's gonna work for your sequence or your particular shot and do a lot of testing before you actually start is really important. So, you know, it's like why we continue on the, let's fix it in pre, let's have a lot of pre-production and a lot of testing to make sure that all of it is working because if not, you are, you know, gonna suffer uh, costs, et cetera. And it's happened in productions where then they're again, put off because they believed in, you know, the hype as they call it, but it's not just, you know, going with the hype without doing your homework and your due diligence. Like it's it's gotta be the right tool for the right job. Yeah, actually, one of those aspects is making sure your audio team is incorporated and in, uh, because the LED volumes present really unique audio problems, not least of which is it's a very it's not really a sound stage, it's a, a bounce stage. And uh, so you've got to get like those audio solutions in as early as possible and try and uh, solve those both from a technical miking point of view, but also just from a, how you build your sets and stuff. So uh, there must be like this incredible need for pre-production collaboration. Absolutely. And I don't think like that. Sorry, Brian. I, I don't think that people talk a lot or at all about audio. And that's not something that, you know, it's it's a lot of echo. There's a lot of, you know, there's there's a lot of photos there. So you do need very specialized team or, the, you know, the people that know what is happening to test that, especially if, you know, audio right there and there is going to be for, for the final use. Sorry. And Brian, you were going to say something. <laughs> All I was going to say is, is you're actually seeing audio influence the evolution of the shape of the virtual production stage. So early stages, you know, were flat and then they became boxed and those were, you know, obviously terrible for audio. And then they became round, just purely cylindrical and talk about bouncing audio all over the place. So then they became more U-shaped and now they're becoming, you know, much more where they U-shape out and then they project with uh, a set of flat panels straight forward. And then you'll have like a plug wall that might, you know, uh, close off to give you a full 360 degrees. Some of those will just slide in from the sides there. Others kind of like do garage door kind of effect and lower down. But the actual shape of the stage has actually evolved because of the audio issues and problems that people have experienced shooting, uh, you know, where you whisper and you can actually hear that completely across the other side of the stage. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. What about um, what about latency? This is an issue that comes up quite a lot, and especially for concerns from DOP. So it's not just having good tracking of where the camera is in the volume; it's making sure you can close that loop, isn't it, Brian? Yeah, there's a number of factors that influence latency. You know, if we were to go over them, the first the first culprit against lat latency is your you know your camera tracking devices. You know, having a good camera tracking device, uh, you know, whether you're optically tracking your camera or so forth, you have to capture the camera's position, translate that into your motion capture software, which then it gets routed to Unreal Engine, which updates the virtual camera and then transact those positional changes. Then you got to render out you know, the image. So your GPU is going to give you a little bit of hit against latency. And then everything that comes out of the computer from there 
has to be routed and potentially converted uh, various signal conversions to get to the final places where it hits the LED processors. They have to scale. Um, so you get all of these different factors that add up to potential latency. Even certain modes that you can turn on and off at the processors, they have like these low latency modes that if you turn them on, you might actually get a slight reduction in the quality of the shadows and you know, uh, you know, how much detail you can see in those shadows, but it might give you an extra frame back. Or if you need that really, uh, you know, detail in the shadows, you could turn the low latency mode off. You wind up getting uh, a little more detail in those shadows, especially if you've got a low light situation. But ultimately, all of these individual things add to latency, including the camera's performance itself and what frame rate you're shooting at. So when you're all said and done, if you're clocking in at six to seven frames of latency at 24 frames per second, um, you know, that's not bad. It's not horrible. <laughs> can, can, can we build out from that? Like, can I do a kind of a best practice, um, sort of best of class? If I was a producer looking to, you know, use a very high end stage because it's appropriate and because uh, uh, my, uh, my team have, you know, determined that that's what we're going to do. What would be the sort of characteristics of a high end stage? So, I mean, we've talked a couple of things about pitch and, and latency. So let's start there. If I was going for a, a new high quality stage today, Brian, what would be an expectation on latency? And then what would be the expectation on pitches of the uh, of the screens? Well, at the NAND stage, they're using 2.8 millimeter for the pixel pitch there, which you know, and the, the row black pearl two panels are camera safe refresh at 19, uh, 1920 hertz. So um, you can pretty much uh, shoot any shutter angle or shutter speed with those particular panels and be okay. Um, but if, you know, if you're building something new, uh, completely new, you, know, you might uh, go ahead and step down to, you know, maybe a 1.8, uh, pixel pitch if you could get it, um, or maybe uh, I'm sure um, a lot of the manufacturers would probably you know, have a, a better sense of uh, which to choose from from a price perspective. But and and on latency, what would you say would be a good state of the art benchmark? Um, I think well at our stages at at Nant and at Epic, uh, we have about seven frames of latency with our current setup. Um, and if you're shooting 24 frames per second with seven frames of latency, you can slightly, you know, you can notice it when you're looking through your camera's viewfinder ultimately and see how it updates as you pan across the stage. You can see that there's a little bit of latency there. Um, but, you know, if uh, I would say that six to seven frames would be considered fantastic. If you're starting to get eight to 10 to 12 frames of latency, you need to rethink uh, of what you're seeing because that starts to become unusable when you're actually shooting. Uh, you can you can definitely feel it when you're looking through the camera. And what sort of color space or color gamut should I be hoping for to in, in this kind of mythical, uh, good high quality stage we're talking about? Uh, I wish I could give you a great answer on color space. I'm not an expert in this particular field, um, but I could, um, I'm going to have to defer and say I, I would have to find that answer for you. Because it's it's a difficult problem, isn't it? Because um, I have this uh, need to quite often have sets that are partially in the volume and partially on the walls. And so I have like a modeling problem, make sure obviously they're consistent and a lighting problem to make sure that the the light works and then just making sure a gray is a gray is a gray on uh, on all of those uh, uh, those areas. Um, and so I guess following that through, there's um, there's a huge effort, as you were saying before, Mariana, about getting our testing done and calibrating because these are not plug and play situations. You want to be able to bring in your assets and and get them up to speed. And I guess having people skilled in that art and being able to make sure that they can get that set up that facilitates on the day it being a fairly uh, seamless and effortless production. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like uh, scaling virtual art departments is probably another, you know, uh, sub a big push that should happen 
you know, different studios around the world as well, because it really is like the virtual art department should be, um, you know, be part of it earlier in the process as well, just to make sure that whether you're like scanning or, you know, if they're you, if they're doing everything, um, you know, CG, that everything is optimized and everything's actually tested and, you know, making sure that everything is working as it should. So I feel like the VAT department plays a, a vital role as well. And it's also if you're doing pre-light, because maybe you're also using the, you know, the volume just to light. Maybe you don't have to use it just for in-camera visual effects. You, you can also use it for, for lighting, and that's totally fine, right? Brian, you discussed uh, earlier, we could discuss budgets. What are the kind of numbers that we're looking at at this uh, higher end? Where are the, uh, where are the cost points? Where are the, where is the budget going? Equipment-wise or? Yeah, equipment-wise, yeah. Um, well, like I said, your panel cost is going to be huge depending upon the size of your facility. So, you know, if an average panel is somewhere, a, a rope, uh, you know, the Black Pearl 2 panels, I think are clocking in somewhere at around $1,800 a panel, somewhere in there. I, you know, I've seen them a little less, a little more. I'm not sure exactly what the final price is, but uh, so if you've got a Mandalorian style stage um, or like the stage we have at Nant, uh, 51 feet wide by 65 feet deep by you know 20 some odd feet tall. There's approximately 1500 panels uh, in the actual volume and about another 1300 panels or so up in the ceiling and then you've got the plug walls. Uh, clearly Ching, there's a lot of money there that's gonna you know hit you. Then you have to have all the necessary megapixel or Brompton LED processors and distribution nodes. Those are going to be um, the processors are going to be about thirteen thousand dollars a processor, uh, and uh, the distribution nodes. I can't remember what the cost is for those. Um, so you've got that. You've got all of your individual control computers and render computers. So if their average you know, workstation class, AMD workstation class machines, you know, with a decent amount of RAM, you're looking at probably about a, you know, four to $5,000 base unit by itself. And then you've got to have the GPU, the Quadro cards, and those are about 5,500 to $6,000 each. Um, and then you have the, the sync card, which is going to be about another thousand dollars that you have to include in those workstations. So, Depending upon how many nodes are going to be driving your wall, you're going to need to have render units for each one of those nodes. <laughs> and they've got all of those. You've got, gosh, there's uh, the HDMI routing of all of the signals out of those machines that send the signals to the processors. Those are probably about, about a $50,000 price tag for one of those uh, HDMI routers. Uh, the Barco E2s, which kind of like give you, uh, you know, a combined referenced image up on the stage, those are $85,000 a piece. Um, Add a Q-take system. <laughs> yeah, the Q-take system, uh, you know, gosh, that's going to be about a hundred grand. Um, you're going to have, you know, your camera tracking. The camera tracking, yeah. And yep. the camera itself. And then, of course, you need, like, you know, <laughs> nice lenses. I mean, where are we at now? <laughs> yeah, Price it's wise? up there. Yeah, your 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 optical camera tracking would probably be about an eighty thousand to a hundred thousand dollar investment. Um, you've got your Ari Alexa at sixty grand plus a lens for another thirty grand, and then all. Oh, don't even get me started on lenses and uh, and stuff. That's a, that's a whole. <laughs> and some of the lenses uh, are more expensive than the camera itself. So. Um, well, yeah, but yeah, you don't so. have to replace the lenses as often. <laughs> <laughs> True. So yeah, obviously hardware is a is a major factor, and a lot of people have asked me time and time again, how can I do virtual production on less money? Do you need to have every one of the things that I listed in a smaller, medium, or smaller size stage? No, you do not. And there are ways to get you know time code and Genlock uh, with cheaper systems as well. Potentially, this is where this is where you want the the virtual production supervisor, right? They're going to know when yeah. it's sensible to make those cost savings and when it's a false economy to do it. We also, I'm going to ask you this: we also hear a lot about the brain trust and or the brain bar or the genius bar or whatever one wants to call it of people on set sitting at a trestle table, kind of making this all work. How what is sort of like the industry practice? Is that still four or five people sitting there, or is that now become sort of an, a much more automated process? Well, the way we have it set up at our stage is, is that, you know, we'll have a control cart 
that's set up that is hooked up to all the computers in the machine room via a KVM keyboard video mouse connection uh, that can switch between machines at a push of a button. Um, so you've got a control cart one, which is usually there for loading up the scene in Unreal and prepping and preparing it, etc. And then it has to be synchronized to the render machine. So typically on a stage, you'll see it two control carts, um, a primary and a secondary. One can be prepping and preparing uh, an, the next scene while one is driving the other. Um, so you've got usually two control carts. You have a, uh, a the cue take cart and video assist cart. Um, and then you might have a, a, a cart that has a machine for your motion capture tracking um, and you know possibly a, a multi-purpose uh, machine that could be uh, available for doing other miscellaneous tasks and preparing things. So realistically, you know, you can see a three to five persons, you know, team that would be driving this stage typically. And one of the things that we sort of uh, aspire to is the ability to drive a lot of the actual stage when the DOP is actively um, lighting a shot with just somebody walking around with an iPad. Um, how realistic is that 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 actually happens and how much is that changed, you think, that relationship between that, that group and uh, the DOP, who's traditionally, of course, the primarily interested in, in how the scene is lit? Um, I would say, you know, are there, is there like an army of people walking around with iPads making all your lighting changes? No, you don't really see that that very often. Occasionally, you might see one iPad, you know, to be able to drive and rotate around the world or the lighting conditions in gross terms. Um, but most of the time, no, um, you know, I don't see the iPads being utilized all that often. Um, typically, uh, you know, the cinematographer is going to be interacting with the virtual production supervisor and, um, you know, they could be shaping the light with with both the diffuse light from the actual LED wall itself, or they might also introduce some practical lights that they can either pull some panels out of the stage and actually insert practical lights uh, into the stage to get some nice hard shadows or some, you know, some direct looking like style sunlight. Um, but uh, you're actually seeing stages now too that have automated removable panels that can be lifted in the ceilings uh, and then drop in practical lights that way. Um, it's uh, people are getting really creative to solving the lighting solution. And it's a I'm seeing a lot of people working in that space wanting to have uh, integrated DMX solutions that yeah. work alongside. I don't know if you guys are seeing that. We are. Yep. DMX is a uh, um, something that uh, intrigues a lot of people. Um, you'll find that they'll use DMX lighting to potentially introduce like traveling light schemes to drive the way the lights potentially flicker or move, um, which can help sell the illusion of movement or some other type of, uh, of uh, sensation or feeling. But it's also introducing a different quality of light, isn't it? Because obviously we can change the environmental lighting. We can have it obviously like a sphere effectively coming in from one side or coming in from you know wherever with the right color and stuff but but you don't get off an led wall a spotlight you don't get off a sharp um narrow kind of dito type uh, situation so there is it's not a a fault of the led volume that you actually want to also introduce some some more traditional lights yeah it's a pretty known factor that led lights or led stages and walls you know, produce a wonderful diffused light that looks, you know, very nice. And you can replicate some great lighting conditions with this type of solution. Uh, you know, you mentioned golden hour. Yeah, you can do that. But if you want like really hard shadows, uh, you know, sunlight right up, you know, at top of day, uh, no, it, it, the wall is not going to provide that for you. You're going to need to introduce some practical lighting for that if you need it. Yeah, you need. I was going to say, just go outside. <laughs> just go shoot that outside. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. Like, what is do we think the like where some of the ways that this the stages are evolving? Because like uh, stages that I've been on, when I first went on them, I was like, so you must be, you know, 
thrashing these uh, these LED panels. And they're like, no, no, we've got them turned down to almost the lowest level of brightness because, and so that opens the door to actually having some of these volumes in unusual places. I mean, you could actually do an open air volume, couldn't you? That's I mean, feasible, you, you, I guess. You could, but obviously not by using it for, you know, just for people in the audience watching this, that you wouldn't do that for like in-camera visual effects or what we've been talking about. You would use because the teardown time, the tracking, all of that would not make any sense. But if you're just going to be using it for lighting purposes, yeah, that can absolutely, you know, that can absolutely work for mapping as well. And you could even, you know, uh, Brian was saying that people are getting very creative. You could even have like a cart with, a, you know, some of these acting as a mesh, kind of like a magic mirror type thing. You know, I think you can get very creative as well for the uses of lighting itself. I was going to say, that's the other one. It's like, instead of just having these LED panels around the outside, surely uh, there's a thought of moving some of the panels into the middle of the volume, because if Unreal knows it's there and it's got yeah. the exact camera angle. I could actually have an LED volume that's actually in the volume. That makes sense. <laughs> an LED screen in the volume rather than just around the outside of it. I have that right here in our little tactical training stage uh, here in Culver City. We just have a, for our training stage, we just have a simple flat right angled wall. Um, you know, it's like um, uh, an eight or a five panel by five panel wall with a five panel by 10 panel wall. So it's just kind of a simple L shape, but we've also just grabbed uh, an 85 inch uh, OLED or, or was it a QLED? I don't remember. It's an LED television that we've actually put tracking markers on um, and we've got it on a stand and we track the position of it uh, inside of our, our small little volume. And we can move that to create reflections. We can move it to cast a little bit of light if we want. Um, it uh, It's not unusual to have a wild wall uh, that's trackable and movable with inside of the volume. Totally 100% possible. What about using the fact that we've got all this tracking stuff to have more mocap in the volume? Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, right now, the both at both stages at the tactical training stage here in Culver and the uh, R&D stage <coughs> in El Segundo, they all have a optically tracked uh, mocap space that not only tracks the camera, but could also track human body movement if you want. So it could be dual purpose and used for two different purposes. Um, I have not yet transacted mocap body performance into a character on the wall yet, but we will. I, I, I plan to try that. I think you've got some meta human -y things hanging around there somewhere that you could go. Going. Um, and then we've seen clearly ceilings, sometimes with lower, uh, with, you know, uh, less fine pitch, but still ceilings above. Um, the production guys that use screens in the broadcast sense, so they're not doing a um, live camera track, but they're just putting them up behind people, have done floors for some time. And then from there, they did floors that actually took uh, notice of where the camera was. But we haven't really seen a lot of VP stages with floors or LED floors. Is that, uh, do you think, useful or not? I would say it would be useful depending upon the subject matter being shot. I mean, obviously, the whole reason why there's there isn't a, uh, a typical stage like that with a um, LED panel floor is, is that they want to be able to blend the floor into the subject matter in the background on the wall. So a lot of times you're going to see stages that have potentially, you know, they're gigantic lazy Susans that can actually turn um and you know you can actually move the subjects on set by turning uh the platform that they're resting on and they'll usually have like a, a lip that will be higher than the lowest part of the of the uh, uh the panels of the wall so the what you're trying to accomplish is to you know seamlessly blend your foreground and midground into your background so i don't think that folks are going to want to sprinkle sand and and you know snow or anything else potentially on <laughs> uh, a panel driven floor uh, for one thing you know but if you had like a zero gravity kind of film where people had a reason to be floating sure. and you needed to have 
sometimes light can be no. I suppose you could just do that as that sort of an extension of what was the micro cube of gravity in a yeah. UVP context kind of thing. Yeah, I was going to say, because also it's like having a ceiling, you have to commit and you're not going to have a ceiling in every situation. You have a ceiling for a reason, right? So the same goes for a floor. I was on a show where they had a floor and it just introduced so many more problems than it was worth at all because they just thought they would try it out. They're like, well, we have a ceiling. Let's just put a you know, floor. They wanted to put some virtual cues, but at the end, it just introduced so many different issues with the seams and, the, you know, it wasn't placed correctly from the very beginning. Then they had to move all the panels. I mean, it was... It was a little bit of a disaster. So yeah, you, you you have to be committed. And again, what are you what are you shooting and why? And then just find the best route for that. Is there anything else that you're seeing in the labs that has taken your fancy as to like future directions in this uh, sort of uh, integration of uh, real time graphics and physical sets? Hmm, well. So I've often said that if you want to see the future, it doesn't come out of nowhere. Normally someone's built a prototype in a lab somewhere and then two or three years later it, it appears on a stage. Yeah, um, I mean, right now, uh, nothing immediately is coming uh, and standing out to me as like, oh, this is the next up and coming technology. I, I think we're still a little bit on that bleeding edge. If I were to project out and think of potential ideas, um, there's a couple things that you know you might potentially see coming in you know two to five years from now, and that would be having the ability to potentially have positional tracking devices either on the subjects themselves moving within the um, within the uh, the volume, so that we can optically know where uh, an object exists exactly in 3D space so that you could potentially extract them out and repo and position them. Uh, and you know, matching the position of these of these tracking devices in the volume and, and tying that to virtual items that are inside of Unreal. I could see that happening uh, and having a communication, a cross communication between uh, you know, props and items that are on the stage and where they exist virtually in Unreal. Um, and if you picked up and move an object in a, practically, it would pick up and move the object virtually. Uh, I could see something like that happening. Um, I was talking with uh, Greg Frazier on another uh, epic panel like this, and uh, he surprised me uh, as you'd expect he would because he's so brilliant. Um, but he was just saying, hey, I love these LED things. I want to wrap them all over the props. He's like, he, he wants he likes flexible LEDs that he can just wrap around anything um, like like wrapping paper and then uh, be able to use them. Uh, so clearly he's seeing a lot further down the road than I am. But um, yeah, they, <laughs> I can only begin to imagine what would happen if we could uh, start coming up with flexible LEDs or at least building the props with the LEDs in them in that sense. it's uh, As long as you can map it, you can handle it as long as you know the camera is right in uh, in unreal yeah and as long as they can be you know how strong can they last how bright <laughs> can they get i mean is this a oh apply <laughs> and use once only thing that could get potentially expensive hard to say yeah I, i'm so, not gonna comment on the future of, of this because i just want like people to like right now because you know six years in and we still have to explain Thank you. What virtual production is. So let's get yeah. present and then we'll start future thinking. But that's the thing about them coming to you, right? Is that you've got the experience in these things. And so they can work out what is the appropriate technology right now? What is the bleeding edge technology that maybe is worth investing in if it's going to deliver? Because, you know, I think for producers, one of the problems is uh, you have to have a good understanding of the cost and the process to say oh well if this is costing a lot but it's a pivotal plot point we're willing to put the money in but if this is costing a lot and it's not really buying as much in terms of the narrative or the story why why put our dollars on the screen there where, where it's not so important and so working with you i imagine is that great process of script breakdown and working out how and why it's going to be uh, cost effective and time effective to use virtual production yeah I would yeah, say, sure. yeah um, I would say if you're looking about future technologies that you could potentially expect these creatives to influence, one of them will be uh, multi-camera 
uh, solutions for the stage, which we're already starting to see examples of now. Um, higher refresh rates for the LED panels so that you could potentially effectively display more than one image uh, on the LED panel and have it be visible to the naked eye for one viewer and visible to the camera for another view. Uh, this is something that has great appeal to be able to, you know, shoot more than one thing at a time. Um, and, uh, you know, I would I would suspect too that um, you would probably see uh, increases in more improvements in in lighting solutions. And and I presume that that education process is continuing. Mariana, they must be like a, a certain uh, chunk of your work that just really goes into that education and informing process. Because uh, I don't know how you keep up because the technology is moving so quickly. And everyone, of course, your clients are all looking for you to to uh, to inform them. Yeah, correct. And and also there is a lot of training that has to be in education to be done for, you know, business developers and for producers as well, because it's not just a matter of like, well, if you were going to use a green screen, now let's just use the volume or just use virtual production, right? Because there's still a lot of misunderstandings and when it's actually going to save you time, when it's actually going to save you money and when it's just definitely not worth it and you should just go on location and just shoot it as per usual. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of education and training that needs to happen. And I, I really wish there was a lot more. Uh, I'm glad you brought up budgets as well, because I feel like the budgeting is still, you know, all over the place as well. Um, color science and producing, I think, are one of the, like those two areas would be really important to have more, you know, education out. Um, like we can do it all with like our clients, our producers, et cetera, et cetera. But the industry needs a lot more, you know, needs a lot more people that come out of schools or technical training knowing these things. Like if you're studying visual effects or virtual production, or, you know, you should know how to bid. You should also know how to produce and you should understand color science and what lots are and how they work on the volumes, et cetera. So hopefully we can see a lot more of that. Yeah, well, definitely. And can I thank you both so much for taking time to uh, sit down with us today? It's been great talking to you. So. Heaps of fun. It's such an interesting area. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mike and Brian. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Likewise.